a missing boy. Most missing people thankfully turn up. Children, they turn up. But there's always one in a thousand cases that becomes more suspicious. This boy, Lee, doesn't turn up. Now what our intention to do is to conduct a thorough search of the immediate area where he was last seen. I did think that he'd been murdered. If I could help you, I would, like, no, but I don't even know the little boy. <laughs> now, I think mm, maybe he hasn't because I haven't found his body. I think all teenagers have secrets that they don't tell their parents. So is he missing? He said that he had seen Lee a couple of days after he went missing, which is obviously highly significant. Or could testimony, unheard until now, point to murder? I could see a mattress. It was certainly a very large, dark stain. I believed it to be blood. A boy who captured hearts and headlines. I've missed my son so dearly. A case unsolved for 30 years. If he has been murdered, tell us where he is, tell us where his body is so that we can bring him home and bury him. Saturday, the 10th of September, 1988. News just in. BBC presenters Mike Smith and Sarah Green have been involved in a helicopter crash. A house in Cheam, a suburb of Sutton in South London. Home to Christine and Peter Boxall, their 15-year-old son Lee and 13-year-old daughter Lindsay. Lee has just rolled out of bed. 2,000 items of Elton John's clothing and jewellery have fetched the impact of the new licensing laws allowing pubs to stay open all day. When Lee was in his teens, he was a wonderful boy. He, he was very caring and conscientious. Me and him were the same. We loved the sun. So he used to sit in the sun with me and he play football out on the green. The morning feels like any other Saturday. We all got up. It was, uh, apart from Lee, he was having a lay in. We were about to leave when Lee came down the stairs and sat in his armchair. And he's still in his pyjamas, still half asleep. Lee has a loose arrangement to meet up with a friend. I thought he said he was going to the football because he had a phone call the night before from his friend and they were going to the football. Several matches are being played that day in South London. I was going shopping. Uh, and uh, I asked Lee what his plans were for the day, and he just mumbled something, rubbed his eyes, and didn't, I, I didn't really understand what he said, but I didn't want to put, press him uh, because I knew he was, wasn't quite awake. So I, I said, well, I'll see you later, and we all went out, and that was the last time I ever saw our dear son. A little later that morning, Lee leaves the family home. Peter gets back at lunchtime. There's no sign of Lee. In the afternoon, I was expecting Lee to come back home um, after he'd gone to see the football game, whichever he chose to go to. But he didn't return. And uh, I wasn't too worried at that time, because Lee's 15 and there's bound to be be the first time when he'd stay out a bit late. But as I said, that would have been the first time. He's never been out late before. Christine, Lee's mum, is spending the night at her mother's. Rang up at five o'clock, because I thought that's what time he would be back if he'd gone to the football. Six o'clock, seven o'clock, so on. And still he wasn't back. Well, I know. That's, not, that's so unusual. I know there's something wrong. We started ringing hospitals to see if he'd 
been in an accident and um, we rang the police, anybody we could think of, and there's still no sign of Lee. And my wife was certainly panicking then, but you know, I said, yeah, keep, keep calm, it's probably okay. There's, there's a first time for everything, you know, he, he'll be home soon. I really can't remember that night, but I know it was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. It was, well, it was just a nightmare. Our worst nightmare. Next morning, there's no sign of Lee. Contacted the police again, and they came around. That they took the attitude as as they would do that Lee was a boy. He's 15. He'll be back soon. The day draws on, and Lee isn't back. A police officer came and he took me by car to drive through Sutton High Street up towards Sutton Station and we were just, just looking just in, in case there was a chance that Lee was still in the high streets. And sadly we didn't see any sign of Lee. The police check all Lee's known haunts. His friends, his relatives, nothing. No reason whatsoever why this lad should be willingly away from home. Day three, and Brendan Gibb Gray, then a detective superintendent from the major investigation team, takes over the inquiry. The chief inspector at Sutton had um, made an assessment of the family um, and felt that this was totally and absolutely out of character. Lee hadn't gone missing previously. And all the signs were that something serious may well have happened to him. In most cases, children, particularly of the age that Lee was, they turn up. But there's always one in a thousand cases that becomes more suspicious and requires further investigation. And that's where the major investigation team come in. But this is peaceful Cheem. For Lee's family and friends, it's hard to imagine Lee has come to harm. We've lived in this house since it was built, and at that time, it was one of the safest parts of London. He almost disappeared without trace. Lee's nowhere to be found, and there are no leads. Coming up, police ask whether he might have run away from home. I got the strong feeling that Christine was overprotective. It did cross my mind that this may have some bearing on what had happened to Lee. And attention focuses on an informal youth club that shows Sutton is more sinister than it seems. The majority of them were girls ranging from the ages of around 13 to the ages of 15 with quite direct questions like, are you a virgin? Who have you had sex with? Oh, look at that lovely picture of Lee in his cot and his teddy bear. Bring back his lovely memories, is next. Yeah. 15 year old Lee Boxall disappeared in 1988. His family cling to memories. I always think if only we could put the clock back, and you can't do that, you've got to carry on. Three days after Lee disappears, the man leading the investigation questions whether Lee could have had a motive to run away. I did get the very strong impression that the father was a very quiet and, and, and a reflective individual, and Christine was much more emotional. You might say that we're all protective to our children, but I got the strong feeling that Christine was overprotective. And it did cross my mind that this may have some bearing on what had happened to Lee. I think I was really such a warrior. Christine admits she was nervous when Lee started secondary school and from his first day shadowed his movements. I got a job at Cheam High School 
when Lee first went there so that I could keep an eye on him. Maybe, maybe I was overprotective, but that's what I wanted to do. I followed him right to the gate, but he didn't know. When I got home, I told him that I was following him and he went, Mum, don't do that anymore. You're so embarrassing. So I didn't. Maybe over the top? I don't think so. Every mum worries about their children. Lee's parents are convinced he hasn't run away. The police questioned me closely. They questioned his mother closely, all of his friends, kids at the school, teachers. They could find absolutely no reason why Lee would run away. So if Lee hasn't run away, could he have been abducted? And where could that have happened? Please focus on Lee's last known movements. The previous night, he discussed going to football, but he didn't go with his schoolmate and friend, Warren Gwillem, to watch their home team, Sutton United, play in Lancashire. Lee said that was too far to travel. I was going on the supporters coach, and Lee gave me 50 pence to um, get my match day programme from the game. And I've kept all these years. Several other teams had fixtures locally, and Lee enjoyed any football match. Charlton Athletic were playing at Selhurst Park, the ground they shared with Crystal Palace, seven miles from Sutton. We had a firm belief that he had gone to a football match. And I think once you've got that in your mind, you rather do concentrate on eliminating all the possibilities. John McQuaid is a former detective inspector who oversaw a cold case review as a senior officer with the Metropolitan Police in 2010. So we know that Lee left the family house at about 10.30 a.m. that Saturday morning. He walked into Sutton Town Centre where he met a very close friend. Lee asked his friend about the possibility of going to the football game at Selhurst Park. His friend did not want to go with him. Catch you later. Yeah, see you later. So Lee was left alone to his own devices. With so many potential matches Lee might have attended, and so many thousands of faces in crowds, his parents are brought into the police station to help scan video footage. That was a daunting task. Looking at the video at the crowd was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Unfortunately, there was nobody there that looked like my son. He was last seen at 1pm that afternoon in Sutton. Three months into the inquiry, the case is on BBC's Crime Watch. United, but they were playing away in Lancashire, so he might have gone to another match. But John McQuaid believes detectives originally focused too closely on the theory Lee had gone to the football at Selhurst Park. If I showed you this missing appeal poster, the original one, you'll see that it says here that he was last seen at 1pm in Sutton High Street. I think that is factually incorrect and he was actually seen quite a bit later. Also that it said he was going, he said he was going to go to a football match at Selhurst Park is also inaccurate. He actually said he was thinking of going there. And the problem with that of course is it, it throws witnesses off who may have seen him later than the 1pm or other witnesses who, who say he gave a different account of what he was going to do. To get to the football match at Selhurst Park, Lee would have to catch a train. There were several sightings of him around town, including, crucially, one outside what was then a Tesco, now an Asda, at 2.20 p.m., 15 minutes' walk from the station. He saw two boys who knew him well from school and from Sutton United, where one used to sell programmes with Lee. The reason that meeting with his two friends outside Tesco is so important is this that at 2.20 p.m. in that location, Lee would not have had time to get to Selhurst Park, a stadium he'd never been to before, for a three o'clock kickoff, and gave them no indication that he thought he was going to try and do so. Did we yeah. over-focus on yeah. Selhurst Park? Well, I suppose looking back, you might say we did, because nothing, nothing came of that. But at the time, we were really dealing with very, very little hard evidence and we had to concentrate on the things that we thought were likely to bring a good response from people. No sightings at a football match, no evidence of running away, no finding of a body. For investigators and Lee's family, it was back to square one. 
one is led to the conclusion that something's happened to him. What exactly that is, it would be hard for me to speculate. Over the years, police revisit Lee's case, seeking a breakthrough. The Cold Case Review reinvestigates the darkest theory, that Lee has been murdered. We felt we just had to reassess the evidence and intelligence and take some positive action to try and find answers. Four known paedophiles and 17 other individuals are checked out by the original investigators, relating to potential sex offending. One paedophile was living near Lee's home and had just been freed from prison after serving four years for sexually abusing young boys. Detectives are suspicious of the offender. However, when he was interviewed, he had a strong alibi for the afternoon that Lee went missing, and he was therefore eliminated. Another boy went missing in South London two years earlier than Lee. Could the cases be linked? Kevin Hicks was just one year older at the time he went missing and lived only seven miles away. He'd left his home in Addiscombe at 8 p.m. to go and buy eggs. He was seen at 10 p.m. walking back, and then he disappeared. The term serial killer springs to mind. However, there is no evidence at all that the two cases were linked and our priority was to turn the focus back on where Lee did go that day. There's little CCTV at this time. Police retrace Lee's steps. The sightings outside Tesco rule out a trip to football. So where was Lee headed after that? I think Lee was in Sutton High Street by himself and probably a bit bored. When he spoke to his two friends at the corner of this alleyway, they said that he walked off in that direction. So he's heading east, towards his home, though there's no evidence he returns there. Close to his home is St Dunstan's Church. In the grounds, an informal youth club called The Shed. It's a popular haunt for teenagers. As a young teenager, this woman, the same age as Lee, came here along with many children from his school. She doesn't want to be identified. We're calling her Sally. I started coming down here when I was 13 years old. Most of the other children who were here were from Cheam High School. The majority of them were girls, but there were also boys, ranging from the ages of around 13 to the ages of 15 that I knew of. A lot of people came because it was like a youth club, really, but they were allowed to smoke and drink. It's not until 1990, two years after Lee's disappearance, that the original investigators become aware of a potential link with St. Dunstan's graveyard. They receive information about a startling admission made by a bank worker at a party in London. He tells a colleague he knows what happened to Lee. An off-duty police officer heard a young man boasting that he and others had beaten up and killed a boy and buried him in the graveyard at St. Dunstan's Church. That officer reported that to the investigation team at Sutton and he was arrested and interviewed. He denied knowing anything about Lee Boxall and said that there were empty boasts. Then another work colleague tells police the man has told her a similar story. A co-worker of his came forward to provide a statement saying that same young man had boasted to her he knew where the body of Lee Boxall was buried and named St Dunstan's churchyard as the venue. The woman takes police to the churchyard to try to identify the grave the man described. They find nothing, and police take no further action against the bank worker. What our intention to do is to conduct a thorough search, a thorough search of the immediate area where, of where he was last seen. But suspicions about St Dunstan's won't go away. Fresh inquiry officers investigate and are immediately concerned. There is a common thread amongst many witness statements of threats of violence, of intimidation, of control, of threats to harm them if they exposed the activities going on at the shed. It's being run by a convicted paedophile. And what happens there goes far beyond smoking and drinking. It was always quite a flirtatious atmosphere with quite direct questions like, are you a virgin? Who have you had sex with? People would talk a lot about their boyfriends. They would either come with them or they'd meet 
other boyfriends and they'd swap around a little bit. Then they would start talking about their underwear and sometimes showing it to one another and things like that. In the alleyway leading to the church, echoes of the youth club. When we first discovered this, it was quite chilling. It actually shocked and saddened me to see this because what we have are the initials of dozens of young teenagers that used to attend the shed. And they've come down here and pointed out their initials to us that they etched into here either in 1988 or around that era. I find it a really sad indictment of what was going on in this area at that time that so many youngsters were attracted to this place. It's not certain whether Lee's name is among these initials. Is this Lee here? L E E? Lee's schoolmate, Paul Ponting, came here. He remembers the shed, which has subsequently burned down. It was a lot smaller than what it is now. Uh, it was basically an old shed, an extended shed. As there was us and the girls, boys. Not so much welcome, I don't think, girls more so. It was a cool little hangout. We was allowed to have a little drink and a smoke in there. If I remember there was an old mattress in the back. Whether it was for untoward business, I don't know. Coming up, how the paedophile controlled children by claiming he had magical powers. He'd tell some of the people here that if they had sex with him, he'd be able to help them get neater handwriting if they did what he wanted. And a dramatic new claim. Could Lee be alive and well, leading a secret new life? He thought Lee was married with a pretty young wife and a child. The early 90s and still no news for the parents of 15-year-old Lee Boxall, who's been missing since 1988. We tried everything to try and get some interest, because it went quiet with the police, so I thought, right, I'm going to do everything else. It was on beer mats, milk bottles, on the body shop van. I wrote to football clubs, cricket clubs, on the boats, ferries, you name it, I've done it. As part of her campaign, Christine is filmed by ITV scouring the streets of London for Lee. There was lots of people, homeless people and people on the streets. Can't help you. No. Sorry about that, really sorry. sorry if I could. If I could help you, I would, like, no, but uh, I don't even know the little boy. <laughs> no one comes forward to say they've seen him. So clearly at this stage, we've got to make an assumption that he may be dead or being held without his will. Brendan Gibb Gray was in charge of the investigation. He's aware how tough the lack of news was for Lee's parents. After all these years, I often think of them and the agonies that they're going through. And it was very difficult as time went on to be able to say to them anything that was encouraging. You could start with being very optimistic and we'll sort this out quickly. And as days goes by, you find there's very little fuel left in the tank or few tools left in the toolbox. And we've got good sightings in the high street, as I say, about lunchtime. It was a very difficult inquiry, difficult for the police, but, of course, more difficult for Mr and Mrs Boxall. I did think that he'd been murdered. I mean, I was so adamant, and I'm looking in bushes. And then I think, hmm. Maybe he hasn't, because they haven't found his body. In 1993, fresh allegations about the convicted paedophile running the shed at St Dunstan's graveyard in Cheam, and how he influenced young girls by claiming to have magical powers. This woman, who were calling Sally, came to the shed as a teenager. He'd tell some of the people here that if they had sex with him, he'd be able to help them get neater handwriting if they did what he wanted, so that he could help with their schoolwork and just generally make them feel happier. 
Investigators in the fresh inquiry now believe there were multiple suspected sex offenders at the shed. Two days after Lee disappears, Sally comes here with a friend. We were then invited into a private place. It'll be many years before they feel they can talk openly about what they hear next, potentially breakthrough evidence in the hunt for Lee. We were told quite blatantly that Lee was not going to be seen again, that Lee was dead and that Lee was buried, most likely in grassland, not far from here. In 1994, Sally gives a statement to police describing what they heard that day. And from another witness, police learn it's not only girls who've been abused. We also have a statement from a young man who says that he was sexually assaulted at the same place. In 1994, police charge the paedophile with sexual assaults against young girls. He's tried at the Old Bailey and acquitted. For Lee's parents, this is a time of no news, no new hope. While Lee has been missing, we've had periods where there's been lots of publicity about Lee, lots of appeals, but then there have been years when there's been lit literally nothing. But suspicion about the graveyard lingers. In 1999, 11 years after Lee's disappearance, Mike Platt, a retired detective sergeant from Scotland Yard's paedophile squad, is asked by the missing persons helpline to check out the graveyard. One of my duties was to have a look at the Lee Boxall missing case. And in looking at it, uh, St Dunstan's Church came up. Mike already knew about Lee. His squad had been asked about the case when they were investigating paedophile rings in central London. At the time Lee went missing, I was, we were conducting surveillance in central London over a number of weeks, which when the officers that were looking into Lee's disappearance came to the West End, we were able quite definitely to say that he hadn't come into our, into our area. In 1999, Mike learns that a second man has spoken about Lee being buried. We can't identify that man for legal reasons. But Mike had come across his name whilst working as a police officer, and now talks to him. He told me that Lee came to the churchyard on a number of occasions, and to quote him, kissing and canoodling with his girlfriend behind one of the trees. And he said that, in his opinion, he was getting his items together to run away from home because he thought his mother would disapprove of his girlfriend. Then, to my absolute amazement, he said that he had seen Lee in Sutton a couple of days after he went missing, which is obviously highly significant. By now, Lee has been missing 11 years. But the man tells Mike Lee is still alive and using the assumed name of Leslie Hall. He thought Lee was married with a pretty young wife and a child and that he had heard that he worked for the DSS in Morden. Until the making of this film, Peter and Christine knew nothing about the claims that Lee could still be alive. I'm really stunned about that. That's, that's a complete surprise. Uh... If he was alive, he would have rang me. Somebody would have recognised him, said, why don't you ring your mum? Maybe the police didn't tell me because they didn't believe the story themselves. If Lee were alive today, how would he look? He'd be in his mid-40s, like his friend Warren Gwillem. I'm always looking for a 15-year-old boy. I can't always come to terms with him being a 45-year-old man. I always promised myself that if I saw her, I, I would talk to her. And as he's walking down the high street, I just said, Christine. This um, man came up to me and said, hello, Mrs. Boxall, I'm Lee's friend. I said, it's Warren. She just went, oh, my God. And. It was a really emotional conversation, actually. I, I don't know whether she was aware of it, but I, I was fighting back the tears because it's a hugely emotional story. I said, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't recognise you because he's a man now. I'm looking for a 15-year-old boy. The Boxalls are about to discover how Lee could look today as an adult. I'm a computer scientist. I work uh, a lot uh, on human face, face analysis. Professor Hassan O'Gale uses technology to show how people who have been missing for years may have changed. He's bringing an image of Lee. It's going to be 
very hard to look at that picture, very interesting. So we, what we did was we actually fed uh, Lee's image along with the parental um, facial images into our system and then we predicted what he would have looked like uh, at age, say, 43 to 45. It's going to be quite, quite a thing to see this, to see how Lee would look if he's, I assume he's still alive. I'm not really sure how they're going to react to this. Uh, I'm not 100% sure whether this is what they think their, their son is going to look like. Well, I'm feeling very nervous, very upset to think I'm going to see a photo of Lee of, as he is now. And that's really going to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, very upsetting, but let's see. Good morning. Good morning. How do you do? I'm good. Nice yeah, coming. yeah. Nice to meet you. We want to make sure, you know, this is as realistic as as yeah. as, as possible. Yeah. So, are you? Do you want to see? Yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Please, okay. please do. This is what we think. Wow. That he will look like. Oh my at wow. age God. Forty-five. That's so realistic. Oh, that yeah. is so. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what to say. But can you see a bit of yourself in him? I, I can see some I of myself see, in there. Yeah, yeah, I can see more, more of Pete than I can me. Wow, that is, yeah. that is really good. <sighs> Back in 1999, former detective Mike Platt tells police of the claim Lee is alive and using the name Leslie Hall. But investigators can find no record of a Leslie Hall matching Lee's age and description. Then in 2009, 21 years after his disappearance, new and chilling allegations of sexual abuse are made against the paedophile who runs the shed. A female victim came forward to police to make an allegation that as a 13-year-old girl in 1987, the year before Lee disappeared, she had been raped by an individual in the shed at St Dunstan's Church. As a result of her coming forward, three other victims were identified. They were aged between 11 and 15 years of age at the time. Sally was among many teenagers who came here. I believe that there were many girls abused here over the years. Only one actually told me about their abuse, and that was someone who believed that by having penetrative sex with the paedophile, he would be able to abort a pregnancy that they thought they might have. They didn't even know for sure that they were pregnant. The paedophile took steps which may have left children unsure who was abusing them. He went as far as hanging a sheet up to hide his identity whilst he committed these sexual offences. The victims have said that this sheet would hang over a table and they would be forced to sit and lie back on this table so his identity was hidden from them. He once fondled my chest, which I wasn't happy with, and he laughed it off and he'd just give you a hug and, and rub your arms. I do know of a boy that told me he'd been abused here. I can't say it was by the paedophile himself because I don't know that, but he did tell me that it happened here. In 2011, the paedophile is taken to court and this time found guilty of rape and indecent assault against girls and using false pretenses to obtain sex between 1985 and 87. He's jailed for 11 years. Then a breakthrough in the hunt for Lee. After the trial, two female witnesses came forward to tell us that they had seen Lee on several occasions at the shed before he disappeared in September 1988. This intensifies suspicions around the activities of the shed and linked Lee closer to what was going on there. And in 2012, Sally gives a statement to police. She visited the shed two weeks after Lee's disappearance and encountered something horrific. I could see a mattress standing upright and sagging in the middle with what, to me, it was certainly a very large, dark stain. I believed it to be blood. 
The smell was quite overwhelming, so much so that I was sick, or certainly was retching. By now, pressure for a full police investigation of the graveyard is becoming intense. But for Lee's parents, it's unimaginable he'd ever have gone to the shed. I don't think there was any likelihood of him going there. I know that he would never go to a place like that. I had no inkling that uh, Lee might have been at that club. It was now I've heard these stories, I was completely stunned. I don't think Lee was secretive, and I don't, I'm pretty sure he didn't get up to anything that I didn't know about. But that's not how some of Lee's friends, who knew him well, remember him. Martin Moxie is now a cab driver. I think all teenagers have secrets that they don't tell their parents, and Lee would be no exception. Um, I wouldn't say he was uh, squeaky clean, he wasn't one of the bad lads, or but I would definitely not say that it's not possible that he um, had other things going on in his life, like most of us do. By 2012, police are convinced not only that Lee went to the graveyard, but that while there, he met a violent end. We decided there was evidence there to implicate three individuals in the disappearance and believed murder of Lee. But they need proof. Coming up, police reach a momentous decision to dig up the graveyard to a depth of six feet. This was a massive forensic archaeological dig. I don't think there's ever been anything like it in the Met's history. For Lee's parents, a new nightmare. I didn't want them to find him, but in my heart, I did. Twenty twelve, and in the fresh inquiry into the disappearance of fifteen year old Lee Boxall, one place in particular is mentioned in statements to police St. Dunstan's Church in Cheam. There has been so much rumour and information coming in linking Lee to the shed and the graveyard that we felt we just had to do a forensic archaeological dig within the graveyard to try and recover Lee's body if, in fact, it was there. When the police came to see me, I thought they had news that they found Lee, but no, they, they dropped this bombshell that they thought Lee had been murdered and buried in the graveyard. In summer 2012, 24 years after Lee went missing, police begin a forensic excavation in the graveyard. This was a massive forensic archaeological dig. I don't think there's ever been anything like it in the Met's history. We had certain areas sectioned off to allow for deep digging, JCBs, ground penetrating radar, and fingertip search between the channels of all the graves you can see in here. Police enter large tombs with vaults containing multiple burials, but are not allowed to disturb the bodies anywhere in the graveyard. Lee's parents are brought to see the dig. It's, it was traumatic for me to come here at that time to see the excavations while the police were searching for Lee's remains. When the police took us to Cheam, um, to the graveyard, and saw it, all these graves dug up, it was terrible. A lot of people really complained because they were their family's grave. So, you know, that was very hard for them as well. It was horrendous. One of the difficulties was that an individual who had claimed to have buried Lee using the craze technique of going deeper when a grave was being prepared for a burial, replacing the coffin on top of the body. That would obviously confuse anybody searching for a recently placed body. It's still upsetting for me to think that the police weren't allowed to open any of the graves. They were only allowed to excavate in between the graves. So there's still a possibility that although Lee hasn't been found here, he could still be here. The dig lasts a year, costs a million pounds, and ends in 2014 without finding Lee. 
Three men and a woman who can't be named for legal reasons are then arrested on suspicion of murdering Lee and perverting the course of justice. But with no concrete evidence, they're questioned and released without charge. The jailed paedophile who ran the shed is also questioned about Lee's disappearance but denies all knowledge. I just pray that somebody will come forward and tell us exactly where he is. I need to find my son. It's a case that's very close to my heart. I've met the family on several occasions and really feel for their pain and anguish. It was really disappointing that we aren't, at this time, able to give them any answers as to what happened to Lee other than hypotheses. I'm fairly convinced that the evidence points to foul play and that Lee met his end that afternoon. In 2013, Peter is asked to make a speech at the Christmas Carol concert given by the Missing People Charity in St. Martin's in the Fields. I just happened to mention that I'd had a dream that I was singing the song about my son Lee in the church. And the charity said, oh, well, why don't you come along and sing it? And I thought, oh, well, they're just joking. You know, I can't sing, I can't write songs. Where would you like to go, folks? At St. Martin's in the Fields, please, at uh, Trafalgar Square. So very emotional yeah. standing there. I don't know how you do it. I really don't. Because I couldn't do it. Somebody out there watching who knew Lee, who knows what happened, they must feel in their heart, I must say something. Somebody out there has got to know, please come forward. In 2013, I came to this very church and sang a song about my son, Lee, called Where is Lee? And from that event, they formed the Missing People Choir. And I'm so happy they did that because it gave other people in a similar situation the chance to join me in this choir and sing for their missing loved ones. Singing in this church reminds me of when the, the police were excavating the graveyard looking for Lee's remains. Singing helped me through that time. It gave me something to distract my attention away from what was going on in that.